So, um, good afternoon. Hopefully, some of us are awake after <laughs> after this uh, um, rough morning. I know that if I sit down, given that I'm from New York, um, after one minute of sitting down, I fall, do fall asleep, I'm trying to catch up for the time I don't have that in at night. But in any case, um, uh, this was a great introduction to our topic because. Uh, uh, Eddie was covering uh, Swift on Open Power, which is uh, the proof of concept we have done to measure uh, how to operate or how to the uh, where is that the impact of um, open open power um, or Swift running on open power. And uh, so I'm Jacob Caspi. I'm a principal architect uh, at AT and T, responsible for our uh, cloud architecture. Uh, uh, Tom Matthews, who is a distinguished engineer with Power System at IBM, and Chris, Christian Rice, who is the VP of Hyperscale in Canonical, uh, which we all did this uh, together. So uh, we actually delivered this presentation at, uh, across the street at, um, at the OpenStack uh, um, Summit, so some of uh, this, so especially this slide may, may not be applicable because obviously, hopefully everybody here knows what the open power is. But the, what we wanted to emphasize is why we actually looked at open power for Swift, uh, given that Swift is not the most uh, CPU intensive or memory intensive uh, application, yet still we feel that it benefited from um, having open power uh, uh, as the base architecture for it in, for a more efficient use of the CPU. So, Tom, if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more about that. Right, sure. So, as the chart says, right, I mean, is, is that there's some characteristics that, that open power has that are really critical for this particular workload, right? Um, it's got a lot of threads, it's got more cache, it's got more bandwidth. And, you know, through this POC um, and, the, and some of the performance work that we've done, we still have some performance work to work through. But, you know, we see, you know, uh, comparatively, you know, fairly significant performance differences, right, uh, in this environment with this workload uh, running on top of open power, right? I mean, one of the... You know, at least in my opinion, one of the strengths of open power, right, it was built as a, uh, you know, the workloads that ran on it and so forth, and it moving forward, it was built as, as a, uh, you know, as a data machine. And, um, and <clears throat> those characteristics, uh, you know, uh, that brought, 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 were brought forward from that uh, really have a significant uh, impact on performance in here, right, because this is, you know, open source, it's just about cost and performance. So so uh, we've seen some very good results out of this. The other thing, there's been discussion about, about accelerators. This That's something that we'll be applying to this as well, so. Uh, Keiko, would you like to um, talk about um, what is SWIFT and, and um, what we're looking to get out of this? Sure, sure, Jacob. So um, as you introduced me, I'm a VP for Hyperscale. I'm a canonical veteran, in fact. I've been a canonical for 11 years. And from the very beginning, we've invested in sort of looking at ecosystems and making sure that there is opportunity for multiple vendors to come in and to provide important um, components. And when you look at the infrastructure layer, we've always understood that it's very important to have multiple architectures. And so I'm going to talk here about Swift and at the end around our tooling, but just to understand, our view is that the tools we provide and the operating system we provide is the same no matter where you're running it. If it's in private cloud or public cloud, if it's on x86, power, or other architectures, that you've got the same experience, the same tooling, and the application and the operational team as much as possible can navigate regardless of where they are. So our investment in, in Canonical in general is making easy access to software and to high value operations. Swift is one of the tools. I'm also responsible for the storage BU at Canonical. So Swift is one of the products that we've looked at for years and said, this is a great alternative 
alternative for people that are at the moment stuck inside expensive arrays or expensive um, NASs for recording what is typically um, low IOPS, high volume data that everybody has plenty of and lots of people throw away. So Swift is a great answer for that because it is pure software. It can run on any hardware. In fact, across the cluster, you can have any configuration hardware and Swift understands the sizes of the machines and how many drives they have and how much storage capacity and knows how to balance it out. Um, Swift has a two-tier architecture. It has a proxy on the top and object storage nodes at the bottom. The proxy is essentially there to handle API requests, which are of the sort, store an object and give me back an ID or retrieve an object based on the, that ID. The proxy in Swift is essentially what handles all the northbound communication. Everybody's requesting data or putting data into the object store is talking to it. And the proxy itself sends streams information, in fact, streams the data back into one or more object storage daemons, which sit in the back end. So the object storage daemons run on the servers that actually have the disks where data gets stored. Um, in this example here, we don't have this on the slide, but we're going to be looking at specifically erasure coding, which is a strategy in which you don't have to replicate all the data. In fact, you can use something which is analogous to RAID inside a single machine, RAID 5 and, and, and RAID 6 in particular, where you're calculating parity. Um, and so in Swift, what you do is when you get an object that comes in and you're doing erasure coding, that object gets cut up into chunks. We calculate parity blocks, and those are stored in the underlying object storage targets. The high-level net benefit is that instead of requiring three times the copies, which is sort of industry standard for scale-out storage, you may require 2x or 1.8x or less. So it's really a significant savings in terms of disk capacity required. And this is why the, the investigation has been done here looking at power as a vehicle for providing erasure coded back object storage is so important. It's because we really want to see economies of scale and driving down cost in each of the individual components there. Great. Thanks. Um, so um, this was a test environment. Tom, would you mind describing? Yeah, sure. So this test environment, there were actually three SWIFT clusters here. Um, as part of the work that we're doing, um, there's, there were three SWIFT clusters here, actually, um, of the same type. Each one of them um, had uh, six um, uh, power servers and uh, open power servers in them. As a matter of fact, the same ones that I saw in the Connecticut pitch uh, a few minutes back. Uh, in addition to that, there were we used uh, super uh, um, uh, six super micro uh, drawers in the environment. Um, a fair amount of storage here, uh, and also uh, a dedicated proxy server in the environment, and 10 gig networks for data and one gig for management in the environment. And and the software was Ubuntu software, um, uh, obviously. Um, you know, Swift and OpenStack, right? Um, uh, coming out of open, uh, coming out of um, uh, uh, the community. So um, we have um, we've had uh, two goals uh, when we uh, started this proof of concept. The first is strict functionality, meaning does Swift work? on open tower in the same way that it works on 8x86, meaning from a functionality perspective. Are we losing anything? Does it take a lot more effort to deploy? Does it, are we, did we get any gotchas while we uh, did the installation? Um, and the response to that is pretty much it went as well as we expected to have done if we have gone to any new uh, uh, x86 environment. So from a, a Swift deployment perspective, we, we found very little differences on whether we went to an open power um, uh, processor versus x86 processor, which is very important for us at at and because uh, we, we are very concerned with uh, large scale operations and making sure that operation teams have unified tool and unified deployment that we don't have to differentiate between one CPU versus the other, uh, which would have caused a barrier to entry uh, uh, within at and uh, The other thing that we were uh, testing is, of course, performance, meaning how well does the, um, does the cluster perform and what kind of efficiency do are we seeing versus x86? Of course, we, we don't have we did not have a benchmark. We did one-to-one -one comparison between x86, but 
Um, as uh, Keiko mentioned, we, we're testing erasure coding. In this case, it's two para data and two parity, which allowed us to do a one to 1.5 um, data replication. So imagine that's, you know, it was more or less half the amount of hardware that we would have needed if we have done it again with standard um, uh, 3x replication, which is normal with, with OpenStack, um, uh, with OpenStack Swift. Uh, as you can imagine, AT&T has huge amount of data, and every every ounce we can squeeze out of the hardware, and every ounce we can we can uh, make more efficient. Uh, in terms of storage, translate to a huge savings over the scale of data that that we that we store, and that's one of the major reasons that we looked at Open Power because if we can do the same workload with, let's say, less CPUs, less power, less space, in in when you do look at exabytes worth of storage that translate to a fairly significant amount of, of reduction in capital investment. Uh, so some of the test results, um, basically uh, we've done uh, various, various loads, anything from um, uh, 900, ob 900 objects as a small load to a 2,000 object as the high load, and varying the amount of work uh, uh, of workers on the on the servers, and, and as you can see from the graph, uh, we barely touched 50% utilization on those servers. Now, of course, we went with with the servers that we had in the lab. We 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 didn't do much optimization, but as you can see, uh, we definitely over provisioned the servers. So even if we cut the CPUs by half. Uh, we could have still managed to do the same amount of workload that these servers produced. Um, and the other thing that we measured is the failure rate, looking at 64K objects to 512K objects, given that we, we have a variety of workloads uh, on these. Uh, you can see the, from, a, from a success ratio rate, meaning how many times that did we have to go back and retrieve the same data, uh, there was almost no, uh, no significant discernible difference between um, when we loaded with 32 workers or 1,100 workers. Um, and pretty much we've concluded that, w at least with our environment, we could not generate enough load to stress the environment and, and, and um, overload the, the servers. Now, the other thing that is very portable is repeatable, uh, import is a very, very repeatable solution and repeatable deployment. Of course, when you do, again, exabytes worth of data storage, you must have really good tools, you must have automated deployment. So that's where uh, some of the tools from Canonicals make, make a difference. Yeah, and in fact, object storage in particular is a great example for open power coming in easily into, into any data center. Everyone needs an object store. Currently, people are putting data into um, S3 in buckets, paying $30 um, per gig per month, sorry, per terabyte per month. And so if you look at that, there's obviously an opportunity to come in. Power can come in without changing any of the operational tooling because we're using exactly the same operating system and tools on top. Um, here as in anything else that they would already be using there. Benchmarks are hard, so we normally tell people they have to be reproducible, and we've worked together with AT&T and IBM to make the entire set here rep um, reproducible. We provide automation tooling with Maz and Juju, which again are what, are, are what we use at every single OpenStack and storage customer that we have. And so the code in there is code which understands how to handle quirks and networking peculiarities across every customer that we've ever worked with. Um, we invite you to come and talk to us more about what it is that we did to get the reproducibility scripts on your own and to understand how Power and Swift together can make a difference. Thanks very much. Thank you, and uh, I really like to thank IBM um, and the Austin um, lab team for helping us set up this environment. I know they had to work and crunch time to give us these results to, so we can present in this, in this forum. And of course my team, uh, especially Cindy Bilovitz and my team for uh, 
working nights and getting this result in time. Thank you.